In today's video, I'm going to demonstrate some of the generative sequencers that are available in the Ornament and Crime Hemisphere Suite. So we'll start by looking at very simple sequencers like Sequence 5, a simple five-step sequencer. We'll also look at trigger sequencers. Then we'll look at analog feedback shift registers. So then we will finish up by looking at the Enigma app, which allows you to build complex songs using different shift registers which you chain together. So stick around, there's a lot to cover, but it'll all make sense in the end. Let's begin by doing a quick overview of how I'm going to set the patch up today for these demonstrations. We've got the standard setup I've often used in my videos of Pam's new workout here for clocking and modulation. And here is Ornament and Crime, which is running hemispheres. There's a link up there to my introduction to hemispheres and how to get it loaded onto your Ornament and Crime if you have the standard firmware. I'm going to use Mimetic Digitalis as a source of pitch information. It has four built-in clocked sequencers here. Today, we are going to be using two new oscillators that I just got. They're not new, but I just got them. One is the Basimilis Iteratus Alter from Noise Engineering, and it's a great kind of bass drum synthesizer. Manus Iteratus, again from Noise Engineering, very gritty uh, kind of bass line melody generator, but can also go up into higher pitched. I'm going to use FX8 as usual as our end of chain audio effects. I've got a delay into reverb patch set up. Let's start with a very simple patch and we're going to start with the simple trigger sequencer applet and we're going to see how that works. What does it do? It generates triggers. It's that simple. But it actually does it in a rather unusual way. You have two parallel eight step sequencers here, uh, sequencer A and sequencer B. So sequencer A will output uh, on this left output, so output A here, and because I'm on the left-hand side, sequencer B is going to output triggers from output B. So we clock it by sending in a clock on input number one, and we reset the start position by sending in a trigger here on input number two. If you look here on the screen, you'll see this little line that's going to indicate where the playhead is. If you don't send in that reset signal, the playhead will just start from where it was the last time. Maybe that's what you want. In that case, it's okay. I'll patch in a clock here from output number one. Now, both of these guys here are now running, and you notice they're both running in parallel. The same clock drives both of them, and the playheads are in different positions. So let's straight away just send in a quick reset. I think I have outputs four and eight set to the resets. So I'll just use a shorter cable here, output four into trigger input two. Now what we'll see is both of the playheads go back to the beginning. There we go, perfect, exactly what we want. Now let's look at how we actually edit these trigger sequences. It should be pretty obvious from looking at the screen that anywhere you see a white dot or filled in circle, a trigger will be generated and an empty dot or a black circle means skip this step with no trigger output. But how do you edit these? Well, first of all, you select them in groups of four by pressing the left knob. Now I'm selecting that group of four and back around. I can select the first two groups of four, and if I press it again, I can adjust the length of the sequencer by turning the knob. You see how I'm doing that there? Now I'll just go back to eight steps for simplicity. Press it again, I'm over here, and I can edit the steps. I can edit the steps, and then I can edit the length of the sequencer. Let's use that to trigger the BIA. So I'm gonna patch in the output from trigger sequencer into the trigger of the BIA, and Hooray, we have a kick. Now, take a listen as I go in and make some edits to the pattern. You hear now a very different pattern there. And there. So I can be editing this on the fly as we're playing. Now let's actually use Manus Iteratus. So again, we have a sequencer running over here. And what we're going to do is patch the output of this, output B, into the trigger input here on sequencer 5. Now you're noticing these, the sequencer 5 here is advancing in time with the triggers being generated. This is going to generate just a pitch, so we're not actually going to get a trigger out of this. And the other problem is, of course, we need a reset to go into trigger 2 here. Same principle applies if I hit play and then stop. You see the sequencer starts from the last point you left off. You need to reset it by sending in a reset. And I've got output eight here of PAMS set up to generate a one-off reset pulse, just like we did for trigger sequencer. Now there seems to be a little bug here in that it always goes back 
to the second step of the sequencer, not the first one. So it doesn't go to the one on the left, it goes to the one next to it. Don't know why that is. I'm going to have to look at the code and see what's going on here. Now we need to send a trigger into the uh, Manus Iteratus, into its trigger input. So I'm just going to use this passive mult here to, there you go, you heard him playing away there a second ago. We're going to use that to send the trigger into Manus Iteratus, but we will also use it to send the same trigger down into the sequencer. And we're in business. Now let's look at the other trigger sequencer, which is the trigger sequencer 16. This is a classic 16 step sequencer. So steps are either on or off. Again, we edit them using the knob to move between groups of four. And then we adjust the length at the end. And again, knob steps are edited using uh, binary. So as you turn the knob, it sets different patterns of steps on or off. Now there's something a little unusual about trigger sequencer 16, unlike trigger sequencer, which just has two eight step sequencers. This one uses the B output to output the alternate version. So in other words, B will output a trigger on the black dots and A will output a trigger on the white dots is another way to think of it. Which means we can do something fun like this. So I've dialed up Manus Iteratus to make this sound. So now what we can do is trigger it on the alternates. So what you will hear on the white dots is this. And on the black dots, you'll hear this. Let's take a listen. Again, it's just a very simple trigger pattern, just triggering two different oscillators. But because we're able to play around with when they get triggered, you can have some interesting rhythmic effects, especially when combined with a delay. Now that we've looked at the basic sequencers, let's look at the generative or feedback shift sequencers. And the first one we'll look at here is shift gate, which I have loaded in the left hemisphere. Shift gate generates two parallel gate streams or trigger streams. It uses a feedback shift register where the output is fed back into the input and also the inputs on CV1 and 2 are sampled for outputs A and B and used to generate bits into the register. This is feedback shifting is used to generate new values constantly. So it's generating random values by sampling the input and also XORing or exclusive oring that with what's in the register. First of all, there are four parameters for each of the two of the shift registers here, the A and B registers. The one on the left here is the parameter for the length from one to 16, I have it set to five. And then you can choose whether you want to generate triggers or gates. Triggers are, as the name suggests, just a trigger pulse whenever the register has a one on the output and a gate stays high until the next value of zero. Then you can do the same for the B sequencer over here. And I've them both set to five, but I have this one set to gate and you'll see why in a second. The outputs are represented by these two moving lines here. The one on the left is the A output and the one on the right is the B output. As before, we clock it with a digital input onto clock one. So if I just plug this in and hit play, we straight away see our two shift registers moving. The values in them are looping around and looping back into the register. And if I adjust the lengths, things start to change in terms, you can see the pattern changing there. I see the pattern of shift register eight changes as I change the length up and now it's changed again into a more predictable pattern. So you can vary the pattern by changing the length of the shift register. How do we load in new values to the shift register? It samples CV1 input for the A register and CV2 input for the B register. So what I want to do is send in just high or low values. Um, it doesn't really matter what they're clocked to. I just have these clocked against the standard clock on PAMS. So they'll get sampled and loaded into the register. So we're constantly generating fresh values in there. Let's start off by maybe uh, triggering a drum. 
Why not? So we're gonna patch that into the trigger here on BIA. Now, every time you see a white dot or white line there, that's the playhead there on the right hand side. You see that? That's what's being output. So every time you hear it, it's a trigger. Lovely, we're generating triggers. So now we can play around with them. Like I can adjust the length here of the shift register. Obviously if it's one, nothing much happens really. Four, things get a bit more predictable. I'll just leave it at say seven. What are we gonna do with the B register output? Well, let's uh, let's use that to trigger Manus Adoratus, for example. It's not gonna be that exciting. You can probably already guess what this is going to sound like. What if we actually didn't trigger the drum sequencer, but used the sequencer A to just trigger Manus Iteratus. And we're going to use this here, set the B sequencer set into gate mode to modulate some of the parameters and see what it sounds like. So if I have smashed down at zero, it sounds like that. If I dial it up, it's wild. So we can use that to generate some very interesting changes here. Let's have a listen. So don't look at the shift gate as just generating only gates for triggers. It certainly can do that. You can use it as a source of unpredictable modulation as well. Now that we've looked at generating gates and triggers, let's look at generating pitch information. And for that, we're going to use the shift register applet here, which I've loaded in the right hemisphere. Shift register implements a classic Turing machine feedback shift register, which can be anywhere from one to 16 steps long and the notes are generated into the register according to a probability that they'll be changed and feedback loops based on the contents of the register. The greater the probability, the p-value you see here on the screen, the more likely it is that the register will contain new notes looped back into it. If you move the index off, the little editing index flashing here off, you'll see a little padlock symbol appears and that means the register is locked and will just loop around constantly generating the same values. So if you find something nice that you like in terms of a melody coming from the register, just set it to lock and nothing will change and you can play away. As before, we clock the shift register using a clock on digital input one. So here we see the register clicking away. The outputs have quantization on them. So you see here, I've set the scale quantization to Dorian, which means the outputs will be quantized into that scale. Output A is quantized to five bits and output B is quantized to eight bits. So you'll get 32 semitones output from output A and 127, in other words, the full spread of the MIDI keyboard from output B. Let's plug it into Manus Iteratus, which we have set up as our oscillator here. Now I'm going to do the same setup as before. We are going to patch a clock out of uh, PAMS to clock the shift register, and we're going to use our trusty mult here to also patch that into the trigger. Now we just have the triggers going in. Let's then take the output A, which remember is the five bit output of the shift register and pop that into the pitch input here on Manus. Kind of random, kind of all over the place, but that's the general idea with a shift register you're going to hear a lot of randomness to it. And now you're already hearing there. Did you hear the melody changed? New randomness was introduced because I went into the P parameter and once it was off the padlock mode, it was playing and it created new values into the register. I navigate it off and now those are locked into the register. And I can adjust the length of the shift register to create different kind of patterns of those notes coming out. So how can we combine a shift gate and the shift register? So I'm going to clock the shift gate using PAMS, but this time I'm going to clock the shift register using the output of the sequencer A on shift gate. So instead of being clocked every single time, we're going to only create a new uh, pitch piece of pitch information when the shift gate generates a gate. Of course, it's not enough to just clock that. We also have to generate a trigger for 
the actual oscillator. So we'll patch that into our trusty molt here and we will patch that into the trigger. So now we're generating a trigger into the oscillator every time we generate a gate to move the shift register and we will patch that pitch information in. And now let's take a listen. And as I adjust the shift gate length, we're generating new gate triggers or trigger patterns. I, I keep calling them gates, they're actually trigger patterns. Which of course is clocking this shift register slightly differently each time. Now I've built up a slightly more complex patch by just using the two inputs as before into the CV1 and 2 inputs of shift gate. So we get new gate triggers sampled into the buffers. I'm continuing to shift the uh, clock, the shift register, of course, using the output of shift gate sequencer A. Sequencer B, I've patched into the low pass filter here on the iterator. So every so often it'll throw the filter wide open to generate a totally different sound. And for fun, we're also just gonna trigger the uh, bass drum so we have something rhythmic to listen to in the background. And here I am just playing around with the different parameters on my shift registers. So now you see how you can combine the shift gate and the shift register to generate kind of crazy wild melodies.